Good morning. I'm Larry Bickford, your moderator for today. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Monadnock Summer Lyceum with today's guest speaker, Elise Hooper. Before we get started, I'd like to thank today's musician, pianist Virginia Eskin, for recording the music many of you enjoyed while waiting for the live broadcast to begin. Also, thank you to the Reading Foundation for generously sponsoring today's event. For many years, the Monadnock Summer Lyceum has brought outstanding world-class speakers to the Monadnock region to serve as catalysts to inform, engage, and inspire an active citizenry on local, national, and global issues. The Monadnock Summer Lyceum is supported primarily through contributions from our audience. We deeply appreciate your donations, which this year may be made on our website or by mailing your donation. During this challenging time, we need your help more than ever. Today's talk is being recorded and will soon be available as a podcast and as a video on our website, monadnocklyceum.org. The talk will also be rebroadcast on WSMN next Sunday at 4 p.m. <clears throat> and on WUML this coming Wednesday at 10 a.m. As is the tradition of the Lyceum, after the presentation, our speaker will answer questions from the audience. Please submit your questions by using the live comments section on Facebook or YouTube, or send them to our email at monlyceum.gmail.com. After the broadcast, you may provide feedback on today's program, suggestions for next summer's speakers, or join our mailing list through our website. Our speaker today is Elise Hooper. Think back a decade or two when computers were new devices in schools. In one particular school, where I had the good fortune to work for many years, we had a lab full of computers. 20 computers, wow. Picture 20 students, each sitting at a computer, staring intently at a spreadsheet trying to balance a family's budget. The students were learning about immigration to the US by looking deeply at one particular immigrant group, in this case, the 1840s Irish. It was the time of the Great Famine. As they learned the story of these immigrant families, they processed what they learned and turned it into one family's story as told through a journal. This was their assignment. The aforementioned spreadsheet was designed to help the students understand and track their family finances. The students sat at their computers, alternately studying their budgets and writing in their journals. Suddenly, out of the silence in that classroom, a student began banging on her desk in frustration, shouting, I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be poor. Of course, that unhappy student was our speaker for today, Elise Hooper. My little story might tell us a bit about Elise's intensity and her drive. Since those middle school days, Elise has become a teacher and a writer. Her writing subjects include photographer Dorothea Lang and several female Olympians. But we might ask, why does anyone bother to read historical fiction anymore? After all, aren't such novels the ultimate ex example of creating a false reality or what we might even call fake news? In fact, through the application of extensive research, creativity, and imagination, historical novelists can shed light on the lives of historical figures. But let's not hear from me. Let's hear from the novelist herself. Let me introduce the acclaimed author and my former student, Elise Hooper. Hi. Thanks so much, Larry, for introducing me. I knew you were going to tell that story. <laughs> How could I resist? I, know. I mean, I've held on to that um, that passion for you know my subjects ever since banging on that desk. Being, <laughs> I mean, really, who wants to be poor? You <laughs> so much in that class. So thank you so much, um, and, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. It's a it's a beautiful Sunday morning. I'm here in Boston. I just landed. I do want to be clear. I'm not in the witness protection <laughs> since I realize my my background looks a little spare, but I am in a hotel room 
having just landed with my family uh, to enjoy some vacation here on the East Coast. So, so again, really, thank you for tuning in. It's, it's a gorgeous day, and I'm sure you all have plenty to do. So we'll keep this moving so that you can go about the rest of your day as well. But, but thank you to the Lyceum for having me, for inviting me. This is so lovely. Uh, Virginia, the music was wonderful. I, I loved it. And you know, Fanny Mendelssohn, your, who was your first uh, composer, is, is people always ask me about a book about her. So I've got her on my short list. So thanks for that. Um, and thanks to Larry. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Um, and really, I think, I suspect, for, for inviting me to this. Um, I'm really grateful to be here with all of you. I wish it could be in person. And, and I'm always an optimist. And, and I think we'll be back to that at some point soon. But yes, I'm here to talk to you a bit today about writing about overlooked women in history, <laughs> which quite honestly is really redundant because most women, let's face it, have been overlooked unless you're Cleopatra or, or Elizabeth I. Um, you know, most women go about their, their lives in complete uh, anonymity. And so I'm um, trying to play a small part in, in changing that a bit. So. So uh, I grew up here in New England. Um, this is where I really developed my love of history. Uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up right outside of Boston. Um, I went to Louisa May Alcott, uh, the Orchard House for drama camp as a young girl, which certainly uh, infused me with a real love of the area and, and, and our history. And then I was in New Hampshire for middle school and high school. And, and so all of this is to say I was a lucky student who could go out on field trips to places like Plymouth, um, Sturbridge Village, Paul Revere's house, all these places that, um, you know, really bring history alive. But of course, also there were many clever teachers who figured out how to infuse a love of history. And, and I do want to point out that, that Larry was so tricky. He was a real trickster as a teacher because he, he was charged with teaching us computer science, which to be honest, was not my cup of tea at all. And, and of course this was long before the era of Fortnite and Sims and other things that maybe, you know, kids these days are so, um, screen savvy. This was well before that. But I think Larry, who had this classroom full of wriggly, distractible middle schoolers, he understood that. And so he was quite clever. And he developed, as he mentioned earlier, this curriculum called Irish Immigrant. And rather than saying, you know, Bueller, Bueller students, today we're going to be doing spreadsheets. He was so savvy in the sense that he he gave us all personalities and people who we had to make up their whole existences. I think I was a chambermaid at the time. And, and so we had to use Word to write our journals. We had to use Excel to um, create our budgets. And all of this is to say, I have really no recollection <laughs> of learning how to use Word or Excel, but we just did because we were really preoccupied with this whole idea of building these new personalities. And so he was the ultimate trickster where I think that Larry Bickford understood well before in this sort of era of like, um, you know, fashionable education where everyone's trying to talk about uh, empathy, he understood that. And, and he understood that the best way to teach was through storytelling. And that has stuck with me all these years through my own teaching, through my writing, that people learn best when there's a story around it. I mean, that's how our brains are wired. The, the brain science is all there. That's part of our survival. We have learned to survive through stories told down to us generation to generation. And so, and not only that, but, you know, I, I will, I will hazard a guess when I think back to that classroom of middle schoolers that we were, most of us, born and bred in New Hampshire, if not close to it. And I think that Larry was able to teach us uh, the challenges of being an immigrant in a new country. I mean, I will never forget clearly that frustration of the meager income I was getting. How on earth was I going to balance that with the high prices of the city we were living in? I've never forgotten that truth. And, and that and that has definitely been a valuable lesson when we when you know looking at the broader world and all the people who have come here, who continue to come here to this country in search of a better life. Um, I think Larry did a wonderful job of teaching us that otherness doesn't really exist. We're all in this together. So thank you for that. Clearly the lessons have stuck with me for, you know, the decades since that. 
Um, so yes, I am a novelist. Uh, my first novel was The Other Alcott. I've then wrote, written a book about Dorothea Lange. And then my most recent one was uh, about women Olympians. And I, I'm going to talk about all of these. I also, my husband sort of uh, was also a trickster and packed a galley of my new book that will be coming out uh, next March. And he was reading that on the airplane. And I can just tell you, there's no stranger thing than to be sitting next to someone who is <laughs> reading your story for the first time. Like he would chuckle or something and I would try to glance at where he was in the story. So a little bit of a funny trip traveling from Seattle to Boston yesterday, last night. Um, and so I'm often asked why I don't write nonfiction. If I'm writing about real women, why do I bother fictionalizing? And that's a great question. I mean, you know, as, as Larry mentioned earlier in his introduction, we are bombarded all day long by misinformation through social media, through all kinds of things. And so as a novelist and creating possibly a false narrative, am I a part of that spread of misinformation? I, I, I wonder this all the time, and it's something I'm always holding my feet to the fire with. However, I want to point out that um, history continues to evolve. Um, we know from, from multiple studies out there about eyewitnesses and, and how accurate their reporting is. You know, five people can witness the same, let's, let's say, car accident. And each at the end of when the incident has ended, each have their own tale of what happened that can look really different from the person sitting only, you know, uh, a few, standing a few feet away. And that's, that's not unlike history. History really depends on the teller. And for a long time, the people who were, who were codifying our history were a very sort of narrow set of people. They were literate in a world filled with illiterate people. They were of a much more educated class than 99% of the rest of their world. And so they were seeing a sliver of history. Kings and queens and um, most of us, have little to do with that. Most of us come, very few of us, I mean, come from any of that. And so all of this is to say that it can be, it can be a whole new world of studying and investigating the history of people who weren't necessarily the people in charge, not necessarily the people in power. And so, um, you know, you can go about writing the history of a man fairly easily. Usually that man leaves quite a record, uh, everything from, you, you, so you can create a cradle to grave accounting of his life from his uh, property records, maybe his banking records. I mean, all of this of course depends on the era. Uh, we can determine his job, possibly his voting status. We can um, see, perhaps he was literate and he was writing his own letters or journals so we get a glimpse of maybe his position on things. Um, in, in So, to boil that down, I mean, a, a man has over the generations left behind quite a record behind him. But women have not. Um, women have had very little access, obviously, to property rights. Um, I always remind people that it really wasn't until the Equal Opportunity um, a Credit law passed in 1974 that women could even have their own credit cards or really a bank account that wasn't co-signed by their husband or uh, a father. And so clearly, um, you know, women have had very little agency for a long time. And really, if you were an upper class woman, there was a long saying that, or there was a saying for a long time that you really only wanted your name in the newspapers twice in your life, upon your marriage and upon your death. Uh, and so for many women, there's really not much of a record left behind. There's a record perhaps of of the child sh children she gave birth to, who she married, and when she died, and that can be it. And so often, if you're interested in telling the story of women, and f that you know is 50% of the population, and certainly a large percentage of the reading population, why would you leave all of that out? There's so many fascinating stories to be told, and so much to be learned from these women. And so I have made it now my career to explore these lives and, and try to draw out of them how they're timely to us today and what we, can, what we can learn from them. And really over the trajectory of these books of mine, um, I've moved really from perhaps the most well-known to now I've been kind of going into more and more obscure women. So I'll start with kind of a life that was very well documented, which was that of Louisa May Alcott. 
Louisa falls into the rare category of having a very well-documented life. Um, she was a very public figure during her lifetime. Um, and, and largely that was because she was a writer. She wrote under her own name, which was very unusual for that time. She does eventually have some books she writes under a pen name, but she was um, never really disguising her identity. Uh, she didn't write as a man, which many other women did. Um, and she was famous in her own time, really because of the publication of her beloved classic in 1968, uh, 1968, in 1868. Sorry, I'm still possibly on Pacific time. So I've been drinking coffee, but maybe not enough. And she published Little Women in 1868. And this was a really, this became an overnight success. So Louisa May Alcott was so famous during her lifetime that at one point she became, um, she was uh, hired by a local women's college to come speak to the audience. And she lost her voice as she was traveling to the engagement. And so the, the organizer said, don't worry, don't worry, just come up on stage and rotate and tur turn around a few times for the audience. And the audience will love that. And they did. And really, I mean, think about that. How many people in this day and age could get away with that? Not many. Louisa was um, a, a very different woman for her lifetime. And so that's what makes, uh, that's what really makes the other Alcott really interesting and really unique to me is that May Alcott becomes my subject. And I'll talk about how that happened. Um, and, and her life, which was very accomplished, she was one of the first women to get a painting into the Paris Salon, uh, the first American. She wrote her own book about how to study and travel art and travel and study art in Europe. She married a man almost 20 years her junior. She led a really interesting life, in other words. And yet we don't know of her. She, her, her claim to fame has really largely been obscured in the shadow of her much more famous older sister. And this is such a unique position. Most women who um, have some claim to fame, but have been eclipsed maybe by a more famous figure in their life, usually that more famous figure is a man. Usually it's a husband, a lover, a father. Uh, in this case, it was a sister. And so right then and there, I was fascinated by this idea of two ambitious women within the same family family. But I'm going to back up for a moment and humor me while I just give you a little bit of information about the Alcotts, because I think that's really important to better understand the story of May Alcott. Um, unlike the fictional March family, who is the family in Little Women, this beloved American classic, um, that we know Louisa May Alcott um, she wrote Little Women as sort of a, a loosely fictionalized version of her own upbringing and family. But there was a big difference where we know the March family lived because it's depicted in the story in sort of a genteel poverty. Well, that was a real difference from the real Alcotts. The real Alcotts barely had two pennies to rub together. They were very poor. They are like an apple gruel for some of their Thanksgiving meals. They, they couldn't afford turkey or what have you. Um, so they were a very poor family. And this was largely due to Bronson Alcott, the father, who was a transcendentalist uh, philosopher. Now, part of Bronson's beliefs, and, and I should point out that he was different from many of his transcendental peers. He pushed his beliefs much further than most of his peers to, to the sense that he didn't believe that labor should be paid for, that, that we should go into labor situations um, unbeholden to anyone. And, and that meant not accepting money for it. So Bronson refused to accept for the rest of his life any um, real payment for his work. Now, interestingly, he didn't object to the women in his lives accepting payment for their work, of course. And so really, uh, the Alcotts got through life, largely through Bronson sponging off his <laughs> more well-to-do friends like Ralph Waldo Emerson and others. And also, he got through through the hard work of the women in his life, his wife and his daughters. Now, um, his wife took in laundry. That was one of the things she did to make money. And I just want you to think about how intense that that kind of work was um, well before modern appliances. Taking in laundry was no small ordeal. So she was working very hard, earning every penny. And his daughters worked in a variety of capacities. They worked as 
tutors and teachers. Um, they took in sewing and mending. They did all kinds of things to make ends meet. And these girls and these women regretted this over the court, or not regretted it, they resented it really over the course of their entire lives, especially Louisa. Louisa felt the indignity of this keenly. And throughout her life, she always said, someday I will be rich and famous because of my writing. Well, that someday for a long time looked like its own fiction. Louisa was writing for many, many years without um, seeing any real payout from any of this. And eventually her publisher came to her and there had been a book that had come out and done quite well within kind of a young uh, male demographic. And he said, you know, I think that there is a market to be had in young women. I think if you were to write a book for young women, it would do very well. Well, Louisa was like, no, thanks. I've got no interest in writing for young women. That's boring. Uh, I barely can tolerate young women. My own sisters are pretty much the only women I've ever been able to tolerate. Louisa humored no one, in other words. But, but the publisher was sneaky, and he offered Bronson a book deal if he could get Louisa to write this book that he was trying to convince her to write. So soon Louisa's getting a full court press, both from her father, Bronson, and her publisher to write this book. Well, Louisa was no dummy and the talk of money appealed to her. So finally she said, okay, I'll write this book you want me to write. And so over the course of two months, and to me, <laughs> I feel like I'm a pretty prolific uh, worker, but she wrote a chapter a day. She just wrote Little Women and think about that is a big book. She wrote it in two months. Um, and when she was done, she handed it off to her publisher and said, here, I think this is terribly boring, but if, if you think there is a market for this, good luck to you. Well, her publisher had good instincts because there was a market for it. And really overnight, Little Women becomes a phenomenon of its own. I mean, people were literally skulking around the Alcott's yard, trying to get a glimpse of the famous authoress in her home in Concord, Massachusetts. That's how famous again she was. And so I knew as I wanted to write a novel, and I wanted to write a novel about someone real, I wanted to write a novel about someone who had really shaped so much of my life. And that was Louisa May Alcott. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I had attended, I had gone to Orchard House for drama camp. I had read all of Louisa's books. It was and it was on a trip to Orchard House where I stood in Louisa's bedroom looking at the tiny desk Bronson had built her where she wrote Little Women. I looked at the shelves in that room where all of the translations of, of Little Women are. And I, <laughs> this sounds so dumb, but I realized, ah, people write books. They don't just magically appear on bookshelves. And that's when I, I was probably about 10 years old. I thought, maybe someday I'll write books. So as I knew I wanted to write a novel, I kind of, I came back full circle to this idea of the Alcott's. And really I was intrigued by this idea of transformation. I wanted to understand how their lives transformed once Little Women was published, how they went from being so poor they're eating apple gruel for Thanksgiving to really that suddenly Louisa could afford to travel anywhere. Um, she could finally afford to do the things she had spent so much of her life doing. I wanted to understand that transformation. And I also wanted to understand this idea of fictionalizing real lives and what that meant for her real life sisters who had become real household names in this country. What did it mean for uh, May Alcott, who is better known to the world as Amy March, um, she is is quite a character caricature, as it, especially in the early chapters, as a young girl of that book. How did she feel about that? I was intrigued by all of these things, so I dove in, doing all of this research. But what I realized fairly quickly was that this life that seemed so fascinating to me, Louisa's, it was so well documented. She not only are there several fascinating biographies written on her, but Louisa was a great chronicle of her, chronicler of her own story. She wrote tons of letters; they're they're published. She wrote journals, which are also published. There was very little mystery in Louisa's life. But I also read at one point that when she was famous, when she knew she was a public figure, she actually went back into those diaries and letters and everything. Well, first of all, she was also a great letter burner. So she, she didn't want people to get their hands on letters she felt could reflect poorly on the family. So she burned lots of letters. And she also went back and rewrote parts of her diaries and things to 
create sort of a rosier picture for posterity. And I found this fascinating. And this is such a good lesson for historians that we, none of us are probably great chroniclers of our own lives. We embellish, we make things better than we are. Anyone who's on social media, of course, understands this. Um, we make, we, we leave behind maybe not the most accurate of our own lives. Now, for me as a novelist, this was really fascinating because this really opened things up to interpretation. Suddenly, who knows what was to be believed about their lives? And so I kind of started looking through all of her old papers with a much more critical eye. I also realized really, and I can speak for first, uh, firsthand on this, Writing about someone who is largely housebound writing all day is a, not a very interesting story. And I say that because that's essentially what I do. I am not a very interesting subject to write about because I do basically sit around and write all day. Well, suddenly I was looking to make a main character out of a woman who did just that. So I knew that Louisa was no longer going to be my main character. Her life is too well documented. There's no room for mystery. And she led, you know, after the publication of Little Women, she became kind of a prisoner of her own success. The public wanted more books like Little Women. So suddenly she's producing more books like this and she's writing. She was so afraid of ever being poor again. She just wrote and wrote and wrote. And also, I should mention that back during the Civil War a few years earlier, Louisa had wanted to go to war as a soldier. Uh, of course, that was impossible as a woman, but she did go as a nurse. And while there in Washington, D.C., serving as a nurse for the Union Army, she contracted typhoid disease. Um, and she was treated, as people were back then, with mercury. Now, mercury, we all know that is not what you want to be treated with today. That left her with a lifetime of health complications. And the cruel part of this is right at a time of her life after Little Women's been published and she has kind of the world at her feet, she's actually really acutely suffering from the problems that she is facing from mercury poisoning. And so that's another reason she's largely housebound, with the exception of some trips and, and trips for, to go speak to the public like she tried to do at that college, women's college at one point. But she, there's not much there. And so as I'm realizing I want to write about the Alcott's, Louise is not a great subject. I think about this little room back in Orchard House that had always fascinated me, this little bedroom that had, had all these sketches on the wall. These were done by May, the youngest sister who I mentioned earlier, better known as Amy March. Well, I wondered what had become of her. And when I started digging around, I, I found this great history of hers, that she was this first woman to get a, a first American woman to get a painting into the Paris salon and that she had written this book. Well, why didn't we know about her? And the truth is, is it's largely because she was not someone who really documented every step of her own life. Um, she does. She did keep a diary just for a brief time and, and it's unpublished. It's at Orchard House and, and the people there were generous enough to let me come and read it. Um, she did not really keep many of her letters. In other words, she was very different from her sister who was writing everything down. May wasn't. She was out living life to the fullest. And so I realized that this book that had begun as a real Alcott passion project was quickly becoming a story about women artists because what May did and what started to really fascinate me was that she moves into Boston to live on her own, to study art, and she develops this whole sisterhood of other women all determined to study art in Boston. And then she goes to Europe and kind of the same thing happens. Again, develops this network of women all intent on studying art in a world that is really unaccommodating uh, to them. And just one example as, of this is that um, to really make a a profession out of being a painter, one really had to understand anatomy because the best way to get paid as a painter was to get into painting portraits. Now, the way to understand anatomy is you need to understand the human form. And that means really see it fully exposed. And yet there was this real Victorian reluctance to allow women to see the naked form, be it woman or man. And so many of these women trying to study art in Boston are agitating to have access to male models. And there's real reluctance by the few art teachers out there to do this. And, and one of the big uh, fears was that wouldn't the women be so embarrassed on the streets of Boston when they were out gallivanting about their days if they then ran into one of the men who had been their model. So there was talk of veiling these women while they worked so that their identities would be secret so that this would be a very anonymous transaction. Now, I mean, think about that. 
we can barely get people to wear masks today in the middle of a pandemic. Imagine trying to convince women of the merits of availing themselves very thoroughly uh, to stay anonymous. It did not go over well. And so May and these other women were part of a, a group who ends up being lively and talented and prolific. And this was so fascinating to me because I knew nothing of these women. Very few of us do. And, um, and so I, I put together this whole story about May by triangulating in on all of the sources out there. Louisa was one of these sources. Some of May's classmates did write their own biographies. In fact, there's one, my favorite, has the best title, I Am the Most Fascinating or Interesting of All by Mar Maria Beshkirtsev. Um, I mean, what, what chutzpah, right? She and many others did write articles or they wrote their own memoirs. And so through all of this, I'm able to piece together the lives of these women to write this novel, to show the breadth of talent that was all just itching for its chance to um, be revealed. Now, what's so interesting is now when I go to the Museum of Fine Arts and I, I want to see paintings by some of these women, I'll, I'll give them my list of, of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Jane Gardner and Maria Beshkirtsev and and the MFA will have all of these women. Um, yep, we have her and her and her, but but they're not on display. They're, they're in our storage areas and you have to make an appointment to see them. Instead, the main galleries are filled with probably very familiar names to us, but they're male names. The museum has this amazing collection of all these women artists, and yet those paintings rarely make it out onto display. And I'm very hopeful over uh, the next few years that we'll start seeing a change with that. But all of this is to say that the Alcotts ended up just being a fascinating uh, subject for me to write about. Um, and, and one that really made me hungry that I was realizing there are so many women out there who have led fascinating lives, but um, they're, they're stuck back in storage bins and things like that. How do we get more of those women out of the shadows and into a more um, appreciated realm? And so this really is kind of my path into the woman who would become my next subject, because I was realizing that women's history is really so conducive to writing novels because it's so sketchy and there are pieces here and pieces there. It's not the cradle to grave account necessarily that a biographer is looking for, but it is really, um, it's perfect for the novelist who who is willing after, like me, to after doing all this research to make responsible guesses about, well, what can we conclude happened here? What What is a reasonable storyline to have occurred? And, and to try to bring some of these women, uh, their stories out from obscurity and, and hopefully into your hands. Um, and so while the Alcotts are a really famous family, again, who are well documented, my next subject was Dorothea Lang. And her, uh, she is a woman who most people, when I was working on my book about her, I'd get kind of a blank stare when I would say I was working on a book about Dorothea Lang. But as soon as I picked up my phone and, and showed a picture of Migrant Mother, which is really Dorothea's most iconic photo, it's, it's one you will find in basically every American history textbook uh, taught to high schoolers in this country. Um, that's when everyone knows, oh, oh, yes, of course, I know, I know her work. But so few people know her name. And I was really curious, why was that? Why is Dorothea um, living really for the most part in such obscurity? And really, it's because Dorothea doesn't leave behind much of a written record. Um, she burned most of her letters. She kept some journals that are at the uh, Museum of California in, in Oakland. Um, and you can see those by appointment. Um, really, Dorothea's story is best told through the thousands of photographs she leaves behind, many of which live at the Library of Congress because she was employed by the government for uh, about a decade. And so I became fascinated by Dorothea. And really, um, I had even a funny path into her where I was starting off thinking I was going to be writing about the woman who had become Dorothea's best friend, Imogen Cunningham. I wanted, after having written this book about the Alcotts and traveling across the country so many times to do all this research on the Alcotts, I wanted to write about someone closer to home to me in Seattle. And so Imogen Cunningham, who had grown up in Portland and gone to the University of Washington in Seattle, seemed like a great subject for me. And she was. Um, and I'm delighted to say that there is going 
going to be a retrospective on Imogen Cunningham at the Seattle Art Museum that will start, I think, in November. And it's the first retrospective that's been done on her in, in many decades. So again, I, I think we're starting to see more and more of a tipping point of interest in these women. But what happened as I was researching Imogen is that I bumped into the fact that Dorothea was one of her best friends. And Dorothea became fascinating to me because I was realizing oh my gosh, all these years I've been teaching uh, the Grapes of Wrath or the 1930s and the 40s in my history, US history classes, I had been using Dorothea's photographs without realizing they were hers. Um, and so all of a sudden I wanted to understand this woman who was so different from her peers like Ansel Adams, Ed Weston and Imogen Cunningham. Dorothea started her life as a very prosperous commercial uh, portrait photographer in the 20s in San Francisco. And yet in the 30s, unlike her peers, she experiences this real transformation where she starts looking out the window to her studio and she can't look away from what's happening in the bread lines that are snaking down the sidewalks of San Francisco. And she wants to tell that story. So while most of her peers remained very focused on playing with texture and abstraction in their art, Dorothea becomes a documenter of what's happening in daily life around her. And she becomes a real activist for social justice. This fascinated me. Again, transformation is always interesting to me. I didn't really want to tell a cradle to grave accounting of Dorothea's life. I wanted to understand that transformation when she becomes so interested in the world around her. And without really realizing fully what I was doing, I was working on this novel uh, in 2016. And that was when I think a lot of people in this country were experiencing also a similar transformation where maybe life for many people, the things they had taken for granted suddenly felt uh, under, under um, there was a great deal of tension around these things. And suddenly be people were becoming more political than they ever had and, and engaging in women's marches and things like this. All of a sudden, this kind of transformation felt very timely and relevant to me. So I went about researching more into Dorothea because her life doesn't follow the typical World War II conventional storyline that historians have favored of, of a woman tending to the hearth while the men are away fighting a war. Dorothea had a very messy personal life and she eventually um, takes an unpopular stand against the government and ends up heavily censored and her work banned as a result of that. As a result of all of that, Dorothea was exactly the type of woman I wanted to write about. She was my kind of character because she led a fascinating life that wasn't very well documented and I thought had a lot of connections to today. And so I started digging in to better understand this because many biographers, um, there is a biography about her by Linda Gordon uh, that is fascinating. And many of the others, um, we're painting a woman, a portrait of a woman who was neglecting her family, was having affairs, all while reducing herself to uh, work that wasn't, she was never going to become well paid from all of this. The, the payoff, none of this was adding up. Why would a woman give up so much for so little? And so I started digging into the really negative um, kind of space in Dorothea's lives, the place where there wasn't where no one was really talking a lot about what had happened, her messy personal life. All of these things drew me right in. Um, the biggest, the best sources on Dorothea are the accounts by other family and friends left behind. And she did do a documentary for KQED that I highly recommend uh, tracking down and watching. It's um, available, I think, through Amazon Prime. Um, and of course, her photographs. So all of this, I started digging into all of it. And what emerged was a fascinating woman who I think is so relevant to our current times. And um, it was really shaped, again, I'm interested in that transformation. And I think I had to look back a little bit to her childhood to see some of these influences that would affect this transformation. And these can be found in two things that happen. And again, I, I mean, I believe this is all traced back to two things. She has polio at the age of seven and is left with a withered foot. She was called a cripple by many when she was younger and, and she'll walk with a limp for the rest of her life. She does describe to friends that she always felt like a symbol of contagion. Uh, she, when she returned back to school after her infection, she was different. She was treated as being different and, and she never really shook off that feeling. 
And the other thing I think that profoundly shaped her was the fact that her father leaves the family when she's 12 years old and, and she's never in touch with him again. He really just vanishes as far as she knew. And I think this left a real gap in her life where she felt unlovable and unloved. And I think this too will shape why she spends so much of her life seeking out people who felt different, who felt like they weren't um, on the right side, maybe of the American dream. She could relate to those people. And this was so interesting to me. So really another reason that I think Dorothea has been so overlooked is I mentioned her messy personal life. Um, this can be summed up in so many ways and I'll, I'll paint it in sort of broad strokes. But Dorothea, as I mentioned earlier, arrives in San Francisco uh, in the early 20s from Hoboken, New Jersey, where she had grown up. And she builds this very successful portrait business where she's ph photographing San Francisco's really well-heeled, uh, wealthy clients. And um, she marries this man, Maynard Dixon, who was a larger than life figure in San Francisco. He was a really bohemian figure, a painter, um, illustrator, well-known within the city of San Francisco. And he was a real character. I mean, he, the first time she meets him, he comes strolling in in black cowboy boots. And by the way, this was kind of his normal attire, a black cape, a black Stetson, and even a bit of a, a cane that he used for sort of dramatic effect. In other words, he was larger than life. He was about 20 years older than Dorothea. Dorothea was captivated. And I don't think you have to be much of a psychologist to understand sort of the gaps in her life that she's trying to fill, why someone like Maynard would be so intriguing to her. They marry uh, shortly after meeting and they go on to have two boys. And this is all during the 20s when San Francisco, times are flush in San Francisco. Um, and she's got more work than she can shake a stick at. And, and then we all know what's coming here. There will be this great economic collapse that begins in 1929. Now, during that period, as, thing, as economic conditions start to deteriorate, um, Maynard will remain committed to painting. He will paint uh, over 100 canvases over the course of the ne next decade, and he'll only sell about 10 or 11 of them versus Dorothea, who is still busy with her portrait studio. Many of her clients were so wealthy they could withstand economic uh, uncertainty. But as I mentioned, Dorothea couldn't fully look away from what was happening at, outside of her studio window. And, and this was gnawing at her. And at first she gives herself a few days a week to go out, to sort of forego client paying work and go out onto the streets and, and capturing these moments of, of these men standing in bread lines. Um, she wanted to better document the American experience as she saw it. And, and so she'll go about this and eventually she'll meet this man, Paul Taylor Schuster, Paul Schuster Taylor, who is um, her, will become her second husband. And he's basically in every way different from Maynard Dixon. Uh, he's an economist for UC Berkeley. He's interested in migrant workers. Um, he's writing reports for the government and, and academic materials. And he will hire Dorothea to help create a, a documented visual record of these people streaming into California looking for work. And so um, Dorothea will end up um, creating work that, as I said, lands in every uh, high school textbook. Um, once you know her work, you'll see it everywhere, but it's very rarely credited to her because it's the Library of Congress. Dorothea will become this fascinating figure that I think is so relevant to our time. She's a working mother. She'll be forced to make very challenging decisions about her own family life and how she'll raise her own two boys. And these decisions will leave historians and honestly the public scratching their heads for many years because people can't reconcile how a, a woman could maybe choose a career over her own family. And so me as the novel novelist, I was trying to create, depict a photo, an image, uh, a story of a woman who is faced with very challenging choices and must make decisions at a time when she didn't have a whole lot of options. I don't write this novel to um, necessarily make you agree with the decision she makes. And note, I'm not telling you exactly what decision she makes, because of course, the high school teacher in me has never gone away. And I want you to do some reading on your own. But she will make these 
very difficult choices and they will have ramifications over the rest of her lives and certainly over the course of her legacy. And I try to create a, an image, a story about a woman who is faced with very difficult choices. And I want readers to empathize with those. Uh, not, again, not necessarily agree, but empathize and understand why she'll make those choices. And then my last subject were these Olympic women who are of the 20s and 30s. Um, they are my most obscure figures and therefore they, the women of Fast Girls gave me the most room to really get creative, imagine their lives, working from all the papers they leave behind, the couple of biographies that are written about them, the many newspaper stories that are written on them, all of those I will put together to try to build a picture of women overcoming adversity. Um, and really what all of the women of Fast Girls have in common is that in each of their lives, they have someone who was believing in them, uh, a coach, a father, um, family members, and, and really all of these women were um, living a, a life that many Americans couldn't understand. People didn't wanna see women looking tired in their newspapers. And really that was the complaint. Who wants to see a tired looking, a photo of a tired looking woman in my newspaper? Um, but these women were blazing the way for, for more women, be it Joan Benoit Samuelson, here in New England, we can appreciate her. Uh, Alison Felix, who just of course had an outstanding career in Tokyo. Um, all of the women of Fast Girls had someone who believed in them. And I think that, again, this is the job of the novelist is to tease out these ways that we can empathize with these women, see the path that they took and also believe in them. Because I think that in our era of misinformation and of real divisiveness, it's this kind of understanding that a novelist can bring by slipping into the skin of another person and they'll hopefully be bringing this to their readers where it will challenge readers and make them ask tough questions about why people were willing to make challenging decisions and, and maybe even stand up for someone who was standing in the margins of society. That is the role of the novelist, is to not necessarily just embroider an interesting story, but to help us all slide into a different life. Because I think that it is exactly that kind of empathy that we all need today to better understand each other and this very uncertain, challenging world we're living in. So that is kind of the end of my prepared remarks. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Larry and maybe some of the questions that have been coming in from the audience. So thank you all so much for sticking with me there as I natter on through Zoom uh, or, or through StreamYard rather. I, I appreciate it so much. Um, so Larry, have, do we have any, any interesting questions? We have indeed. And thank you very much for your talk. It was insightful and brilliant and all those good things that I knew it would be. It was great to hear from you. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't bang on my desk here. I didn't do any of that. I was trying to tone it I was in. hoping for the best. <laughs> <laughs> in a previous Lyceum program this summer, the speaker told us that she felt that women did not help each other. Yet in Fast Girls, the women definitely support each other. Which do you think is more realistic? Well, I mean, I think it's both. I think because there are accounts in, there are parts of Fast Girls where the women aren't necessarily always uh, fighting for one another. And I think it's a real challenge that I think women across all eras can understand that that often a woman needs to be willing to really put her own neck out there to get ahead. Um, and, and some women do that at the expense of all others. They're like a babe Diedrichsen, for example, in Fast Girls. She is really out there promoting herself the entire time, sometimes at the expense of the women around her. Um, at the other, on the other hand, there are a lot of women out there who see that strength in numbers and they decide to, as collective action, to try to make, move ahead, try to make some progress. So I, I think it really happens all kinds of ways. And um, I like to think, of course, that I am always trying to put my neck out there for other women, which is part of why I write these books. But I think that it's we we know that women, uh, especially in some past generations, have had so few paths forward that they've had to put sort of everyone else aside and just go it alone. That is often the much more difficult course to take. But I think both we know both are realistic. Both happen. So. Sure. Great. Can you talk a little bit about 
the parallels and the contradictions between Ansel Adams and Dorothea? Because I know they, they did yeah. similar work at similar times. Right. Oh, I'm so glad you bring this up. Ansel Adams and Dorothea were peers. They were friends. Uh, Ansel, I should also say, does quite a lot to help. Dorothea was never much of what, and she would have admitted this, a technician. She wasn't really interested in developing photographs. I mean, she wanted to take the photos. She wanted, she was interested in the people on the other side of her lens, whereas Ansel was also very interested in the science of developing photos. So he, he sometimes uh, did a lot of Dorothea's uh, development. And they sometimes were even paired up together in later in the 40s uh, during some of their World War II work together. But, but there was always a real tension between them because of what happens at Manzanar. Now, Dorothea, um, one of her final assignments for the government is to go in and document the internment of Japanese Americans. And so many people have questions about this. Like why, what was the government picturing when they asked her to go take pictures? Were they, you know, why would they do that? And I think that the government in many ways wasn't really thinking it through. They wanted to document things and they weren't necessarily thinking about how some of those photographs would look later. Um, Dorothea went for the jugular. She took really challenging photos of, of these internment, of these interred people. She wanted to show the real social injustice she thought was happening with the internment. And as a result, her work was censored. The government was realized its mistake in hiring her, uh, the firebrand that she was, and they impound those photos for decades. Versus Ansel then took over. He went into Manzanar and, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm doing a, a presentation and I, I can bring up their photographs side by side, but be, listeners, please do this later. Bring up an Ansel Adams photograph of Manzanar and you'll get the, the sky and, and fascinating textures of the mountains and you'll get these really stark, beautiful images of what that place was like. But Dorothea really is putting her lens right up in people's faces, wanting to show the heartbreak that people were experiencing there. And she she never forgives Ansel for what she thought was selling out um, and, and taking beautiful pictures of Manzanar. She never got over that. She was always angry at, at him for that. Um, and, and, you know, I've, ha I've had so many talks with readers over this over the last few years. And, and some readers have wondered, and I think this is a very interesting theory, that perhaps some of this later work that he does um, in Yosemite, where he takes a lot of, uh, he makes all these photographs that have really become the backbone of the environment environmental movement, was that something he learned from Dorothea? Was that his own brand of activism? And, and instead he was choosing to be an activist for the causes and things that were important to him, wilderness and the outdoors versus Dorothea, who was always interested in people. So, so the two of them give us a really different view into specifically Manzanar, but also into how um, photography can be used. And yet, I do sort of wonder if maybe there are some similarities after all, if, if maybe Ansel did take away some of what Dorothea was trying to do and he infuses it in some of his later work. I think that's a really interesting theory that I really have to credit my readers for. Fascinating, great. I have, I have a huge comment here that I'm just gonna read to you. <laughs> if it goes on for a couple of hours, okay. Uh, the, Member of the audience says, I was trained as a physicist and have come to know many overlooked women of science. Yes. Their histories are a rich source of potential material. I'm thinking of women such as, and he gives a long list, yeah. including Amy Noether, Rosalind Franklin, Lisa Meitner, and the list goes on and on. Does this interest you for a potential novel? It does. Um, I will say there's a novel. So, of course, there is a scramble on in the world of historical fiction of all these authors trying to scoop up, you know, these fascinating stories. There is a novel coming out by Marie Benedict about Rosalind Franklin. Um, and, and Marie specifically has written about she wrote the other Einstein. So she has also gotten a bit of a corner on, on the market on some of these books about women in science. I think I think this is a fact. I mean, essentially, there are so many great stories out there um, in the world of the arts and um, science and um, sports, I would also argue. I, I think that there's no shortage of great stories. I've actually once had someone raise their hand in one of my talks and say, what happens when you run out of interesting women? I was like, that's never going to happen. Um, so 
yes, in short, there are those women that um, I assume many are on that list. Um, th their stories are quickly being uncovered by many uh, other writers as we speak. And so um, keep your eyes peeled on your local bookshelves for all of these to come and, and some that are already out there. I think that um, ex women explores all of it. We're seeing just, we are living in a fascinating time where suddenly there is a great interest in women's stories. I feel very fortunate. Um, thank you for all of you for, you know, buying these books and things like that to send the message to publishers that, that there is an interest in these and please do more of them. I have, a, I have, I have one more comment from an audience member who says, the themes of systemic racism and sexism in Fast Girls are unfortunately as relevant today as they were in the 1930s. Yeah. Do you believe we are making progress or have we taken a step back to that time? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that this is something I have done so many online, you know, Zoom book clubs over the last year, of course. Um, this is something that always comes up in book clubs is uh, readers always say, you know, I can see so much progress being made, but but then is there? And there can be a real yo-yoing sense to this of um, we see in many areas progress. And yet then we look at just what happened last March in the double, in the end double, NCAA women's basketball, um, where the women were given like a post, they were given this tiny little weight rack of like three pound dumbbells to work with. And the men had enormous facilities. Um, I think the best way to answer that is that maybe there is, there is progress, but um, there are constantly, we're, we're yo-yoing back and forth. And um, I think a lot of interesting things came out of Tokyo, the games that just happened in Tokyo, uh, interest in suddenly in, in uh, mental health by these athletes. And I think we're going to see, you know, progress in some areas at mixed rates than others, coaching opportunities, media representation, sponsorship opportunities. I mean, Alison Felix, the most decorated Olympian, was dropped from uh, Nike or, and her benefits were very much cut off when she was pregnant with her child. I mean, we see these things happening then we see other people picking her up. So, or other companies picking her up. Um, I think there's a desire to look at history as constantly, hopefully making progress forward. And I think we all have to start recognizing that it's not like that. Sometimes we'll have, we'll have it'll move in fits and starts. And we need to keep putting pressure on institutions like museums, um, publishers of books. Um, I would say even things like Netflix and um, you know the big storytellers of our era to keep putting pressure out there that we want more stories on this. We want to see more progress because it, it's kind of like I just mentioned, when you know someone else's story, it's really hard to, um, well, you may not you know, love their story or love the person about it. You, you, it's hard to really denigrate and hate someone once you know their story. And we want to start advocating for so much more progress. We need more of these stories out there. And we need to, as consumers, also continue putting pressure out there for, um, for organizations to keep promoting women within their ranks, offering these opportunities for coaching, for payment and coaching and things like that. So I wish I could say that, yes, things are just constantly getting better. I don't think that's always the case, but but it we do have a role to play in that where we can keep trying to demand for more progress. Please, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank we you. hope you have enjoyed today's live broadcast of the Monadnock Summer Lyceum. Thank you for, for your support of our unique 2021 season. Please join us next week to hear Carolyn Finney on the topic, Black Faces, White Spaces reimagining the relationship of African-Americans to the great outdoors.